right, same. Uh, so let's do a slight pivot here and talk about something else that's happened over the past couple of weeks. Um, this is not the first time you've been on this show. We already discussed that was in April, discussed the lockdown protests. This is not the second time you've been on this show because the second time was in October of last year when you came on to break down the Groiper movement for all of us. Now you're back on this show and you're talking about things you covered in both of those previous appearances because the Groipers are back in the news because... Uh, you know, CPAC decided to get a little uh, pandemic get together going. Didn't matter that we're we're still in the you know there's still a pandemic. They decided to do CPAC in Florida this year, uh, and uh, CPAC happened about what was it? Uh, two weeks ago, I would say about yeah. around. Yep, two weeks ago. And you know, the big takeaway from that was basically uh, a uh, anti vaxxers and conspiracy theorists who do like Trump. We're very disappointed in him because he was promoting the vaccine because after all, he got it himself. Right. And another thing was that whole big uh, discussion about the CPAC stage, which I don't want to get into again. Because, no, no, no. Yeah. You yeah. covered that well enough, I think. Yeah. Right. And if anyone wants to catch that episode last week with uh, Mike Rains of the Adventures in Hell World podcast. That was but, great, but- Oh, thank you. I'm, I'm going to let, uh, you know, I've, I've gotten a lot of great reviews about that one and a lot of great words for uh, Mike. I got to let him know. Yeah. Um, and you know, the fact that you two could talk wrestling like that was fantastic. So. <laughs> and you know what? The interesting thing was I let, a, he, I think he dropped all the references uh, that episode. That was a first oh, yeah. on this show. No, no, he was seamless at it. It was great. Yeah. A sh- a, a d- episode of this show where I wasn't the one dropping the wrestling references. I'm, I was surprised. <laughs> uh, but, there was another right wing uh, uh, conference going on that same weekend in Florida, and it was the Groipers conference. What's it called again? The uh, uh, America AFPAC. First. What's the it called? The America First Political Action Conference. AFPAC. AFPAC. You know, it sounds a lot like AFLAC, but right. Just- the America First Political Action Conference. Right, so. and for people who aren't aware, I feel like I feel like he's done a bad job at at uh, branding AFPAC and Groipers because I feel like his name yeah. is still the one most people know of, uh, and you know that's not the case with say like Richard Spencer and the alt right. I would say more people are familiar with the term alt right than than Spencer, but more people seem to be familiar with Nick Fuentes. Then yep. the the name Groipers. And, uh, you know, this is Fuentes' thing. Uh, and, you know, he put this thing together. And I was explaining it earlier on the majority part when I was uh, uh, promoting this episode to uh, the audience on that show earlier today. And I basically was like, you know, uh, you know, CPAC, uh, it was a, you could consider it a white nationalist conference, but it's not like they're not openly branding themselves that like AFPAC does. That's the difference. That's how you can pretty much like parse the difference between the two. These are yeah. like the true explicit versus explicit. Yeah. Right. Oh, that's even that's 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 a good one right there. I don't like that. <laughs> uh so why don't you uh, Devin break down what happened at AFPAC cuz I know you and your organization has really been on top of the Groiper movement and you 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 covered the uh what what went down at AFPAC. Yeah, it was a, I think it's an important event for a number of reasons. Uh, first of all, AFPAC itself um, is a second uh, conference like this that they've held. They held the one about this time last year. Um, that one had about 150 to 175 people. This one had five to 600 people at it. So they've grown uh, substantially in, in a very short time. And what they've done is they've attempted to repackage and rebrand white nationalism for Zoomers in a way that makes it more palatable to the mainstream. So they've adopted the kind of Trumpian rhetoric around America first. They've tried to use language around immigration and demographics to try to appeal to this larger constituency. They've reached out to lots of younger people using uh, various online gaming streaming services, you know, starting with YouTube, then DLive, now uh, Trovo and some other services where they keep getting kicked off of. Um, so they've developed this following of tens of thousands of, you know, uh, of Zoomers who are interested in the 
the kind of melding of white nationalism with pretty hardcore misogyny um, into what they're, they've dubbed the Groiper movement, which is an effort to um, essentially move the Overton window of the Republican Party in the white nationalist direction, right? They want to attack groups like Turning Point USA and um, Young Americans for Freedom and really start to force them to um, either become more openly white nationalist around issues like immigration and other issues around race or get crushed. That's their goal. And they're waging that, you know, they're waging that war on college campuses, uh, online and everywhere else they can find a foothold. And in doing so, what they've done is they've also created a following within some Republican circles. So the big thing that happened at this year's event that really made it stand, stand out from any of the other white nationalist events we've covered for a really long time was that they had a sing, sitting congressman speak at their event, as well as a former congressperson, share the stage with them. So you had Arizona Representative Paul Gosar speak at the, perform, you know, at the, at the event and give the lamest performance of anyone at the event. Um, creepy lighting aside, his performance was dulled by a message that was largely regurgitation around wanting to protect free speech and trying to uh, appeal to that younger generation to, to, and to speak the language of America first. So in essence, by him being there, he gave them the credibility and the standing that they they have so long desired inside Republican circles and really helped um, move them a step closer to the mainstream. You know, you also had uh, Representative Steve King speaking there, you know, the guy who lost all his committee seats because he said, what's wrong with being called a white nationalist? Um, former representative, that, I should add. Yeah, former representative. Yeah, who's now out of Congress. Um, you know, he was a representative from Iowa, but he also helped give some status to that event. Uh, you know, those are big things to have a former and a sitting congressperson speak at, at your event. Um, and in addition to that, you had a few people of color speak at the event to largely promote the same kind of messages and to try to, you know, deflect the charges about racism in the group. You had Michelle Malkin, you know, the, who calls herself the Griper Mommy. Um, who has uh, a long-standing tradition of extreme nativism and Islamophobia? You know, she's written a book called "Defense of Internment" about right. the you know Japanese internment. So that's how far out she is. Uh, she writes for the white nationalist publication Vider, but she is one of those folks who have tried to help you know in this rebranding effort, and she did very much along those same lines on the stage at AFPAC. And then you had um, you had uh, John Miller, a, a writer for The Blaze there, African-American guy who got up and essentially repeated some of the same mantras about, you know, the, um, you know, the attack on, uh, you know, on America first and the necessity for doing that. In essence, again, trying to, to deflect some of the charges of racism from the group, even though he's making essentially the same arguments. And then you had folks like... Um, you had folks like Vincent James, a griper from California, get up and talk about how they're going to try to um, start running primary candidates against the Republicans in 2022 to create a real far right reactionary insurgency, in his words. And Nick Fuentes got up there and talked about the, you know, the basic racial composition of the United States being a white nation and said that America is also a Christian nation. So try, try to both extend his efforts to promote white nationalism, but also to try to bring in some of the Christian nationalism as well. And interestingly, after playing such a role in so, so many of the Stop the Steal efforts that led up to January 6th, Fuentes has also begun starting to parrot a lot of the QAnon rhetoric around the deep state and those kind of conspiracies. So he's also trying to appeal to that demographic to try to reach out to those folks as well, to try to bring them in under the Groiper umbrella, you know, despite how goofy the name is, you know, he's trying to retake the mantle of America first in the white nationalist, the explicitly white nationalist direction. Are, are, is, he, is he still really – because I, I honestly haven't seen them really use Groypers. Are they, are they still going by that even? 
They're not so much, you know, they, you know, he, he's now really bought into the whole America first brand. So they're sticking to that. They still will talk about the Groiper wars and how he's a Groiper general and they still give out little Groiper stickers at the conference, but they're, you know, but they're largely moving on beyond that. They're trying to, you know, again, recast themselves. It's a constant, you know, influencer, influencer rebranding effort that goes on with Fuentes and his compadres i'm imagining i'm imagining like like you said like a a q believer with everything that they they uh they follow uh saying to themselves i don't know about this griper thing that sounds funny i mean <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. uh but yeah true. yeah good point you know, Fu Fuentes really is it really just the platforms they're on? Like, I, I don't. It, it honestly has been a little bit surprising to me how successful Fuentes has been at becoming such a big figure to the the future. I guess you can say of the far white right and and white nationalist groups. You know, there's been a lot of personalities who've come and gone. A lot of personalities who've still been, you know, uh, hacking away at it. But Fuentes has been surprisingly successful when compared to some other people, in my opinion. Oh, yeah. I think his success is far greater than we ever anticipated. I think it's because he has that ability to constantly shapeshift his message to appeal to whatever audience he's in front of. Uh, he's got a uh, you know, solid speaking skill. He's got that sense of irony and... Um, you know, and that comedic, somewhat comedic timing that makes him unique for that crowd. And he's also, you know, climbed up on the backs of a lot of white nationalists uh, to get to where he's at. You know, he wouldn't be where he was without the kind of organizational um, support that he got from people like Patrick Casey, who ran the American Identity Movement, which before that was known as Identity Europa. Um, you know, they've since split largely over the, the decision to hold this conference. Um, but they, you know, what, what but, was the but, disagreement on that? It, it was a pretty public, ugly dispute. Um, Fuentes was going to go ahead with it no matter what Casey said, look, it's too soon after the January 6th stuff. We need to lay low. You're worried about the optics. They're worried about the, the potential for, um, doxing and worried about, um, the potential for, you know, conflict at the event. So we should hold off. Fuentes went ahead and said no, and then totally threw Casey under the bus and started, you know, in a long uh, interview on one of the on one of the streaming programs. I think it was on Killstream went on and on about all the bad things that Casey's done in terms of being, you know, not an effective leader and unable to organize. And, oh, he didn't get the banners for the last conference and on and on and on. Um, despite all that, you know, I think Fuentes decided that he'd gotten all that he could out of Casey and was moving ahead. And he's now got, uh, bigger sights in mind. You know, he's really looking at trying to capture the, you know, the hearts and minds of young, you know, young Republicans and move them in that direction. Uh, so one of the things that in addition to these two Congress people, uh, that was noteworthy about AFPAC. Another notable attendee, which we just uh, this evening released a new piece on, uh, was an attendee um, called uh, Matt Brainerd. Matt Brainerd was one of the original data guys on the Trump 2016 uh, campaign, uh, has done a lot of data work as well as a lot of work around voter integrity, you know, trying to clean, clean up voter rolls and, you know, make it harder for people to participate in the democratic process. Um, Brainerd was it not only in attendance at the at AFPAC two, but he was also a vendor there and looking to gain new clients. Right, he had a prominent exhibition at the event and was using it as a way to kind of merge his efforts around, um, you know, voter turnout and voter suppression with the Groiper efforts to move forward and start running candidates. So we fully anticipate in twenty twenty two to see at least a handful of Groiper style candidates running for office, trying to move the Overton window around the party, even further in the white nationalist direction, um, particularly around issues about immigration and COVID. Um, and so, yeah, so I think we're going to see some more young candidates stepping up, running for office, 
getting experience. And now they've got some people with some technical skills like Brainerd on board to run this. And Fuentes is also sitting on a ton of cash. He recently got a, a massive do a Bitcoin donation from a French programmer who later committed suicide. You know, I think he got the, the equivalent of right now around half a million dollars in Bitcoin donated to him from this, the, from this programmer. Um, and that's helping him fund a lot of these efforts. He's also raising money on his various platforms. Um, and well, he's only accepting well, cryptocurrency now, but oh, well, go ahead. Well, well, there's, there's a lot here. Hold on. I, yeah. you know, I, I might even have to cut this up into two separate podcast episodes. The, the COVID first half and this great part half. I wasn't expecting, uh, these sort of revelations. What <laughs> I missed this. I, I honestly, what you just said, if this was to happen to anybody outside the right, the right would be talking about some big like Epstein didn't kill himself level conspiracy theory uh, in terms of uh, someone receiving a massive donation from someone who then goes ahead and commits suicide shortly after. Who, yeah. who who is this who is this programmer this this you know he he's an i forget his name now but he's a you know i think um there are a few different pieces on it that go into kind of his background he was a you know kind of disaffected french programmer a young guy who was kind of uh loosely affiliated with the kind of incel movement there in france uh, was also attracted to white nationalists so before committing suicide, he gave a massive donation to uh, to Fuentes, who got the largest chunk, but also to Patrick Casey, to VDARE, and a few other white nationalist organizations. He kind of parceled out all this Bitcoin that he collected over the years um, to these folks. And with Bitcoin shooting up the way it is, uh, it actually turns out to be a massive windfall for them. All right. I'm looking this up now. I, I, I must have missed this during the whole—this was a couple of days after— I think it happened right after the election. So it was right in that period where there was already so much going on. The, the news broke right after the uh, the insurrection. So it was probably oh, completely yeah. steamrolled by all that news, right? Yeah. yeah, in, yeah. This, in December 2020, a French computer programmer named Laurent... Hold on, it's getting cut off by the uh, Google... Uh, uh, Laurent Bachelor. That's it, yeah. Donated... More than half a million dollars in Bitcoin. Jeez. Yeah. Wow. What, what a mysterious French blogger, the Daily Mail called him. Uh, I guess not much is known about this guy. He went by the name Pen Pen Pencaki. <laughs> Clever name, I guess. Uh, <laughs> A combination of pancake and, uh, you know, uh, yeah. <laughs> let's, uh, <laughs> uh, I, I, uh, you know, man, big money in being a right winger. God. Yeah. Oh yeah. The grift is strong with these guys, man. What I wouldn't give for a half a million in Bitcoin. <laughs> oh yeah. I mean, you know, and this is on top of the, you know, the nearly $80,000 a year that Fuentes is bringing down in his streaming. You know, while he was on D-Lab, he was making about 80K a year. Right. The, I, I, I'm thinking about it now, and I think I remember, because in December, I had someone on this show to talk about how how um, uh, the right was using, uh, like, encrypted platforms and the blockchain, and we discussed on it how cryptocurrency was, was big fundraising efforts for them. And I think I remember vaguely now the big donation being in the news, but I completely missed, and you know, the big donation is in so, to these right-wing groups isn't so much a, a, a shocker, but I, I completely missed the story about this guy having um, been this like mysterious benefactor who committed suicide shortly after. What a weird, I, I, I got to look more into that. I wonder, if, has it come out? Is there any note left behind? Why, what, what happened with this guy? I haven't, I haven't seen anything more on it. Um, my understanding is that this is, was also one of the reasons why there was some friction between Casey and Fuentes. Um, not just because of that Fuentes got a lot more than Casey did, but also because um, 
as a result of this, Casey went on Killstream and started talking about how um, this was uh, this put uh, Fuentes under FBI investigation. So he was worried about the feds swooping in. Um, so, uh, you know, Casey went on to say that, oh, Fuentes' bank accounts have been frozen and that the feds are coming to get him, um, none of which is necessarily true. Although I do, you know, I, I imagine that there are some curious people wondering like you about that, that big donation. Um, you know, they haven't de determined whether or not, you know, they're going to move forward on it, but I think they're looking at him. But that certainly scared Casey away from wanting to go ahead and start flouting all that at a conference in Orlando at the same time as CPAC. Right. Now, how much do you think, you know, uh, uh, to me, I, I think Fuentes' best move for his whole, uh, the reason he's been able to stand out uh, compared to everyone else right now in that world is that live stream show he does. Um, it's so different than the rest of those guys. Like, you know, uh, all, all those right wingers who, who got big over the past, you know, half a decade or, or even more, like a lot of these guys started, you know, making a name for themselves in like, you know, 2012, 2013, 2014, you know, a lot of them were doing like live streaming, but it was like these long, like, like discussions with like four different people having these big like philosophical debates for hours and hours like who's gonna watch a five hour long uh stream with like sargon of akkad debating with someone else on the right about what the best move forward is for people who don't think that you know, uh, you know, who are fighting the white genocide, you know, all this ridiculous stuff that they would talk about for hours and hours. Whereas Fuentes yeah. has like a more like modern, like talk show type thing where he like interacts with the audience. He's not getting into like these long, uh, drawn out like uh, debates with other people in his live stream that goes on for hours. He's like sort of doing what a lot of like left wing streamers do or what like Twitch streamers do with their audience. It's like uh he he like sort of took what he saw was working outside of right wing politics and and brought it to the right wing uh media landscape. That's just my estimation of, of everything. You are absolutely right. And it's you know, I have to make a confession now. Nick Fuentes and I share something in common. we we were both in high school debate nerds. Um, so he learned a lot of those techniques while, while he was in high school, you know, from high school speech and debate programs and from working on the local high school television program. So he's kind of been in that milieu for a long time. Um, so he's had time to kind of perfect his craft and work on his delivery and his presentation and all that kind of stuff. Um, at the same time, he's moved so much further in the white nationalist direction over just a short time, you know, over like four or five years, um, that it is quite remarkable. And he's someone who early on, you know, even when he was just, while he was still at, you know, just at university, he was carving out a name for himself by speaking at things like the social contract press writers group, which is a big native influential nativist gathering of influential nativist writers um, as well as, you know, getting a hold in some campaign circles. And interestingly enough, he started out as a supporter of Ted Cruz. And now he's moved, you know, he's, he has certainly changed his opinion on that dramatically as he's become more of a proponent of openly fascist ideas and the kind of, you know, notions about, you know, white, white, uh, dispossession and the position of white folks in the country. So, his transformation in a very short time is one because he has those skills that we're going to pay close attention to. I was talking to our founder, Lenny Zeskin, the other day, and he was talking about how Fuentes in some ways reminds him of a combination of a young David Duke combined with the kind of snarkiness and attitude of a young Lincoln Rockwell. Um, so that in and of itself is kind of a terrifying mix of, of figures um, so it, he's definitely one to keep a watch on, but he's just 
one of a whole constellation of these figures that they brought under the Groiper umbrella and are now, they are literally preparing to start running for candidates, running candidates for office in 2022. And I don't think that um, many people are prepared for that yet. Um, I remember back when Duke ran for office the first time uh, and there were not a lot of folks who were prepared for that. And as a result, he ended up winning a seat in the Louisiana State Legislature, at which time he was selling Mein Kampf out of his legislative office. So do I think that this is going to be problematic? I do. I think it's going to be one of the things we got to watch moving forward. Right. And, you know, I, to, to speak to that, too, I think there's going to be a whole you know range of issues with with those type of guys running uh if you think you know take what happened with uh Marjorie Taylor Greene when she ran for office uh her opponent her democratic opponent dropped out and he said he was getting harassed and and receiving and- threats from her supporters her her QAnon supporters and he had to drop out he just he just couldn't deal with it yeah. And, you know, you could imagine this happening across the country, maybe not in every one of their races, but at least a few where you have these Fuentes following Groypers running for office and a, uh, you know, a, a Democratic challenger who's unprepared for the moment and just having to drop out and, and th- throw in the towel after receiving harassment from other, you know, people who love Fuentes. I mean... Uh, you know, combine that with uh, I was reading the other day how the um, the the woman who stormed the Capitol on January sixth and was arrested, the one who allegedly stole Nancy Pelosi's laptop, she apparently was a hu- or is excuse me is a huge, huge fan. Nick yep. Fuentes fan, huge. Like I don't just mean like she follows his uh, you know, his show or whatever. I mean, from what I've read and the screenshots and stuff I've seen or and the discussions in the interviews with her, people who knew her or know her, uh, she is in love with him. Like, she thinks he yeah. is uh, the greatest thing ever. Like, like how you know your parents reacted to the Beatles coming to America. That's how she your views Nick Fuentes. It's far too small a word to capture how much she liked him. Yeah. Right. Like, yeah. She, got, she got a photo with him or something. And like, uh, you know, drew hearts around it and told all of her friends that she was like melting from it or something like, you know, she was in love with it. It's just, you know, it's it's creepy. It's it's scary stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, he's got that kind of, you know, he's got that kind of charisma and that ability to um, reach that kind of audience. And he's also got a plan. Right. They started by using the fights around TPUSA and Young Americas for Freedom to start taking over college Republican chapters, right? And which they've done at dozens of campuses around the country. They're using that as a, pla- as a platform to now start moving candidates out. And they're, you know, they're thinking ab- about the next steps about moving this stuff forward. Now that they've seen an opportunity under the Trump regime, they think that they have the ability to start kind of recrafting and molding the America first message to keep that um, base moving in their direction for the long term. Right. Now, and that, that, yeah, that's really worrisome. Now, when, when you came on last year to talk about the Great British, you had mentioned how, you know, and early how, in the how, year they had this whole big strategy of basically like flooding the college campuses with their, their, you know, themselves and their propaganda uh, but but you'd also mentioned how, you know, the pandemic sort of railroaded those plans and they had to, you know, they, they couldn't do it anymore. There was no one on the campuses for the bulk of last year. Were they able to, to I mean, obviously Nick Fuentes, Nick Fuentes' live stream probably was a huge uh, uh, replacement strategy for Did them you? in terms of... Uh, you know, swapping out the college campus strategy with the Nick Fuente show strategy, but was there anything else they, 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 they moved to so they could, so they were still able to stay relevant? Streaming was the big thing for them, right? So it was not only Fuentes, but you had folks like Jaden McNeil, Patrick Casey, uh, you know, a whole core of them not only had their own shows, they also did a lot of video game streaming together. You know, these would be those hours long, uh, video game chats 
while they were, you know, playing Fortnite or whatever else. Um, and they would bring in folks like Baked Alaska and a whole bunch of other folks uh, to kind of, you know, shoot the, you know, to sit around and gossip and talk about, you know, all kinds of racial, ethnic and gender stereotypes and um, just try to be cool. And um, and it worked for them. I think they they carved out a niche for themselves uh, amongst the, that, that streamer world. Um, you know, amongst the folks who lean to the right, they became personalities and celebrities um, and influencers, and they were successful at using that primarily. They've tried other venues, right? And they keep getting kicked off of them, but they've done so in a way that they use the act of getting kicked off to gain more publicity, right? So Fuentes went on, you know, showed up on TikTok and did so in such a way you know, that he knew he was going to get kicked off. In fact, he invaded the, the TikTok board meeting as a way to kind of make his presence known and then to get kicked off on the platform. Just last week, he showed up on Clubhouse, you know, for just a brief period of time. I think he lasted on there for three hours, but again, used it to use the publicity to say, oh, I'm such a controversial figure. Look at me. They're banning me from even Clubhouse. What do I, you know, what am I saying that is so controversial that you want to hear? Right. It is really using that old strategy of rebellion uh, and fighting against the system uh, to try to make them uh, make a name for themselves. Right. <sighs> you know, it's it's yeah. it's I'm actually, you know, I I I underestimated Fuentes, to be honest. Me too. You know, back Me when, too. you know, all the names were, were coming out in 2015, 2016, these are the the major personalities who are carving their place in the Trump, the Trump world, you know, the, the Trump cinematic universe, you know, Fuentes was one of those guys who I thought, you know, he'll, 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 he'll have his moments, but he's not going to be one of the standouts. He's not going to be someone who like is standing atop the mountain because there's going to be other guys who, who are more successful at doing that. And, you know, as some of these guys are falling out of the spotlight or dwindling away into uh, irrelevancy, Fuentes is one of the few still standing uh, strong. It's it's quite it's quite surprising, honestly. Oh yeah, I mean, and he's been able to avoid the you know the stigma of being around so many of these massively controversial events. Right, he was at Charlottesville, and that hasn't really stuck to him. He was a massive participant in the stop the steal efforts and was organizing, you know, a kind of his own rump rally at uh, the Capitol on January 6th. While he didn't go inside the Capitol uh, when they breached the, the, the doors and the windows, uh, some of his supporters did. And there have been at least now a couple of them who have been arrested. You know, it was his America first flag that flew throughout in the Capitol halls and on the floor of the Senate, um, one of the guys from the guy from UCLA who was arrested uh, was a well-known groiper and a big another big fan of Fuentes. All right. Uh, well, I guess uh, Devin, I'll be having you back on this show when uh, when there's a whole uh, a whole lineup of groipers running for for office. Yeah. <laughs> Well, hopefully you can have me on to talk, to, you know, some, about something more interesting. We can talk music or something. That would right? Be yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, something. <laughs> right. Uh, thank you so much for joining me today, Devin. You know, between the 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 COVID uh, update of where these mask anti maskers and anti lockdown people are at, and how the right is still weaponizing uh, them, even when they don't know they're on the right. And the Groiper conference that uh, seems to be the kickoff of something much bigger for Nick Fuentes in the coming years. Uh, you, you, uh, a beacon of uh, good news and hope in a <laughs> in a in a, in a well, world that's <laughs> becoming more difficult to live in every day. Uh, yeah, let's uh, yeah, let's do it again sometime. No, but for real. <laughs> Uh, always a pleasure when you you come on this show, Devin. Um, Devin Berghardt, everyone, executive director of the uh, Institute for Research and Education on Human Rights. Where can people find your work and follow you? 
you know, they can find me at our website, which is irehr.org, or follow me on Twitter at dberghart. That's D B U R G H A R T. And I hope, you know, if any of your listeners out there are interested in learning to do the kind of work that we do, uh, hit me up. We're about to do another series of research trainings to kind of walk people through how we do what we do uh, and to get more folks engaged in it because there's way too much activity going on for any one organization. The more folks we've got out there who have skills to track this kind of stuff, the better. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Especially since all, all these uh, figures got deplatformed. And now instead of just knowing at least like, you know, we can follow for the most part, the, the main, you know, thread lines on like Facebook and Twitter and, and YouTube. Now there's literally like 20 to 30 different platforms and still more coming and growing every few weeks, it seems like. Oh, yeah. yeah it's interesting. You know, it's good that there's a platform so they're not, get, you know, spreading this stuff to uh, the broader public, but it's made uh, the life of the people who track the, these guys uh exponentially harder to be honest <laughs> i'll take the trade off any day yeah that's true that's true thanks a lot Devin. have a great night thanks matt